So it's nice to be here on the 11th day of the 11th month. And tonight I want to reflect on what meeting Veterans Day may have in our lives as individuals and as a community and as a Sangha and as a society. Some of you may have heard my first IMCC talk, which I gave around the time of Memorial Day. And I promise that I won't always speak about war in the military. <laughs> in that talk, I encouraged us to reclaim Memorial Day as a time for spiritual reconnection with the suffering of war and its casualties. And I suggested that uh, doing that is a good way to honor those who have died at war. And so here we are on Veterans Day with another opportunity to pause and reflect, even as this country's war on terror enters its 14th year. On this spiritual path, we are interested in getting to the root of things. The Buddhist teachings essentially boil down to a roadmap for recognizing, investigating, and uprooting the causes of our suffering. And so when I started to prepare this talk, I thought I would go to the historical route of Veterans Day and learn a little bit more about this day. The day that we now term Veterans Day, and we see it primarily as an opportunity to recognize the service and the valor of those who've served in the military, it was originally created as Armistice Day. World War I, the war to end all wars, began 100 years ago this year, so it's an important anniversary year. And fighting ceased after four years on the 11th hour, on the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918. Bells worldwide were run on this day to celebrate the peace and to commemorate the fact that there had been 37 million more than 37 million casualties in that conflict. And at the war's conclusion, our Congress responded to a sense of hope among Americans for peace. There was a real hope that that would be the end of war and that peace could be possible. And so Congress passed a resolution that called for, and this is the quote, exercises designed to perpetuate peace through goodwill and mutual understanding inviting the people of the United States to observe the day in schools and churches with appropriate ceremonies of friendly relations with all other peoples. Later, Congress added that November 11th was to be a day dedicated to the cause of world peace. And this understanding of the day continued for decades. The writer Kurt Vonnegut shared his memories of the day he wrote, when I was a boy, all the people of all nations which had fought in the First World War were silent during the 11th minute of the 11th hour of Armistice Day, which was the 11th day of the 11th month. It was during that minute in 1918 that millions upon millions of human beings stopped butchering one another. Actually a pretty remarkable thing. I have talked to old men who were on battlefields during that minute, and they have told me in one way or another that the sudden silence was the voice of God. It was not until 1954 that President Eisenhower signed into law an amendment that deleted armistice and inserted veterans, which also changed the focus of the day. And so tonight I want to ask, what would it mean to restore the original intention of this day? Might we take an opportunity tonight to practice Armistice Day by reflecting on why war arises, how it can be prevented, and how peace can be built? And at the same time, how might we honor and preserve the intention of our contemporary Veterans Day, a time to honor those who have served? So tonight I offer that one way we can do this is by listening to the words of veterans. Having direct experience as both warriors and survivors, they have unique insight into war and peace, or they, they, they may. We need to find out. 
Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh has extensive experience working with victims of war and with veterans, working for healing and reconciliation. And remarkably, he's done a great deal of work with Vietnam War uh, veterans, Americans. Um, he, was, he was in Vietnam during the war, and so his work is traced back to that conflict. And he has written, Veterans are the light at the tip of the candle, illuminating the way for the whole nation. If veterans can achieve awareness, transformation, understanding, and peace, they can share with the rest of society the realities of war. In the Buddhist path, we cultivate non-harm. We seek to transform the karmic seeds of conflict, violence, and suffering. But if we begin to look deeply, we immediately see that this is not an easy practice with obvious applications, especially when we try to take it into the complicated field of social and political conflict. There is a necessary grappling and seeking to try to understand what it means to abstain from harming ourselves or others or reducing harm for ourselves and others. And I'm struck that this grappling is actually currently reflected in some of the responses of Buddhist teachers and leaders to this country's militarism, where there's a spectrum ranging from people who take an explicitly anti-war stance to people who are doing things like bringing mindfulness practice to combat troops. So not just veterans, but people who are getting ready to go into combat in the hopes that this can help to reduce harm to self and others. It's, a, it's an important debate that's, uh, that's happening right now. So as someone with veterans and fallen soldiers in my own family, I have thoughts, feelings, and insights on this topic, but I actually want to spend the rest of the evening offering up the words of people who have been much closer to the lived experience of war than I have. I've selected three excerpts from three stories. They span three wars. One is written by a combat medic serving in Afghanistan. One is written about a Vietnam War veteran. And the last one is um, a first-hand account written by a soldier in the trenches in World War I. And they all, they touched me, each of them, for different reasons, so I thought I would share them. And uh, to, in doing so, I want to invite the practice of deep listening. Thich Nhat Hanh has identified wrong perceptions on both sides of a conflict as really the source of conflict and violence. And he offers deep listening as the antidote. He's written that deep listening is the kind of listening that can help relieve the suffering of another person. You listen with only one purpose, to help him or her to empty his heart. If you, want him, if you want to help him correct his perception, you wait for another time. For now, you don't interrupt, you don't argue. If you do, he loses his chance, his chance to unburden his heart. You just listen with compassion and help him to suffer less. And Thich Nhat Hanh says that just one hour like that can bring transformation. And so as I read these three stories... I would invite you to listen deeply. And if your own assumptions and judgments arise, don't worry. Just release them and return to that intention to just listen. I will pause after each story to let it settle in, and then I'll ring the bell before starting the next one. The first story, Message from a Combat Medic, by Angela Carusa Yan. One morning on deployment in the Afghan theater, my crew of two flight nurses and three medics loaded into a small pickup truck to cross the base. My heart pounded and my mind raced. This morning we were going to tour a bomb-laden fighter plane. 
we could take photos and even write messages on bombs that would soon be delivered to their targets. The internal discord I felt in that single moment was parallel to my experience of many years of military service. In the Venn diagram of my life, where do circles of Buddhist practice and military service intersect? How do I mindfully and authentically stand in that intersection? With my self-identified liberal friends, I like to pepper the description of my Air Force duties with words like non-combatant and humanitarian as I look for affirmation of their nodding heads. It brings me a little temporary comfort to downplay my dilemma. But the truth is, whether I am in a room full of flag-waving soldiers or in robes at a Zen retreat, I am simultaneously a member of the armed services and a spiritual being. I believe this is true for every service member. My first enlistment was what I was in what I and the U.S. government called peacetime. With the idea of responding to natural disasters and providing first aid, questions about right livelihood and non-harming were far in the background. But then came September 11th. In the following six years, I was on active duty in combat zones as much as I was home. It was painful to feel that I was a cog in the wheel of war. Even as a non-combatant, I was contributing to suffering. People of the Middle East, as well as men and women in the armed forces of many nations, faced the physical, social, and psychological traumas of bodily and systemic violence. As my first term of enlistment expired, I was emotionally and spiritually exhausted. Despite the respect and appreciation I often received for my service, I wasn't sure that service would stand the test of right motivation and right livelihood. I left the military with no plan to return. Two years later, a former colleague called to ask if I would re-enlist. Without a pause, I said I would. Each time I saw a story about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, it was clear that, regardless of my presence or absence in the combat zones, the suffering of war went on. And despite my work with peace and justice organizations and my many hours of meditation, taking off my uniform did not bring a sense that I was contributing to peace. Now my immediate response surprised me. I was back in uniform, but there was a change. I noticed that my ability to contribute to war or to peace was now present in each moment, dependent on my awareness, intention, and engagement. I could continue to think of myself as a trained, machine-like asset of the military. Or I could be a whole person, mindful of every interaction I had in combat. Every day and every mission, I face a series of internal questions. Am I doing the right thing? Am I open in this moment or just going through the motions? Am I stuck in the notion of being a hero? Is my work really of benefit to others? Or is it a way to placate my sense of helplessness when I read the news? Conclusive answers don't come easily, but these questions serve as bells of mindfulness the opportunity to directly serve in the combat zones and to work with others in circumstances of suffering and stress. Those are my great teachers. When the morning came to stand on the blazing Afghan tarmac and lay hands on the bombs that hung below the belly of the fighter jet, I knew I had choices. I could stand aside from the members of my crew, my statement as an outspoken pacifist. But I chose to come forward. I climbed the ladder with a marking pen in my sweaty palm. Each run on the ladder was a moment and a breath. I reached up and put my hand on the rough surface of the weapon, and still I did not know what I would do. 
Other messages expressed racial and religious slurs and outright rage. It all read as pain to me. I took a moment to practice Tonglen, giving and taking, opening to the suffering of those who built this bomb, those who would deliver it, those who would suffer the death and destruction it would bring. Even if I abstained from writing on this bomb, I would not be separate from it or from all these people. I took up my pen. With just a few lines, I drew my own image of non-duality on that one-ton bomb and descended the ladder. I don't regret that I was there or what I did, nor am I proud of it. It was a moment that simply brought more questions into view. I understand that each of us sees the world in our own way, even when wearing the same uniform. And I see that on the deepest levels, and at heart, nothing is separate. How shall we live? The second story, Beginning Anew, excerpt of a Dharma talk by Thich Nhat Hanh. During the Vietnam War, there was an American soldier who got very angry because most of the soldiers in his unit got killed in an ambush by Vietnamese guerrillas. That happened in a village in the countryside So out of his rage, he wanted to retaliate. He wanted to kill a number of people who belonged to that village. So he took out a bag of sandwiches, and he mixed poison into the sandwiches and left them at the entrance to the village. He saw children coming out and happily taking the sandwiches, thinking that someone had left these delicious sandwiches, and they ate together, enjoying a lot. And just half an hour later, he saw them beginning to show signs of suffering. Their father and their mother and sister came and tried to help to give them massage and medicine. But the American soldier who had hidden himself not far from there knew very well that there was no way to save these children and that they would die. Out of anger, he had done things like that. If anger is strong in us, we are capable of doing anything, even the cruelest things. When he came back to America, he suffered because of that. That scene appeared to him in his dreams, and he could never forget it. He could not talk about that to anyone except to his mother, who said, well, that was the war, and in a war you cannot prevent these things happening. But that did not help him. Nothing helped until he came to a retreat. It was a very difficult retreat. We sat in circles and invited people to speak out about their suffering. But there were those who sat there unable to open their mouths. There were war veterans who were deeply wounded inside and fear and despair were still there. Finally, that American Vietnam War veteran was able to tell us the story of the poison put into the sandwiches. It was very good for him to be able to tell it, especially in front of the Vietnamese people, his former enemies. I gave him a prescription. I said, now look, you killed five children, yes. And that is not a good thing, yes. But don't you know that many children are dying in this very moment? everywhere, even in America, because of lack of medicine, of food. 
Do you know that 40,000 children die every day in the world just because of the lack of medicine and food? And you are alive. You are solid physically. Why don't you use your life to help the children who are dying in this moment? Why get caught in the five children who have died in the past? If you want, I will tell you how to save five children today. There are children who need only one tablet of medicine to be saved, and you can be the one who brings that tablet of medicine to him or to her. If you practice like that every day, the children who died because of the poison will smile in you because these five children have participated in your work of saving many children who are dying in this very moment. So the door was opened so that the man was no longer trapped in the feeling of culpability. That is the ambrosia of compassion, of wisdom offered by the Buddha. There is always a way out. That war veteran has practiced and has been able to help many other children in the world. He has gone back to Vietnam, has done the work of reconciliation, and the five children who died have begun to smile in him and to become one with him. The garbage can be transformed into flowers if we know how to do it. And the third story is an account of the Christmas truce in World War I. It's a famous story, but I don't think it's nearly famous enough. This account was written in the trenches by Private Frederick Heath, an English soldier. The night closed in early. The ghostly shadows that haunt the trenches came to keep us company as we stood to arms. Under a pale moon, one could just see the grave-like rise of ground which marked the German trenches 200 yards away. Fires in the English lines had died down, and only the squelch of the sodden boots in the slushy mud, the whispered orders of the officers, and the moan of the wind broke the silence of the night. The soldiers' Christmas Eve had come at last and it was hardly the time or place to feel grateful for it. With overcoat thick with wet mud, hands cracked and sore with frost, I leaned against the side of the trench and, looking through my loophole, fixed weary eyes on the German trenches. My eyes caught a flare in the darkness. A light in the enemy's trenches was so rare at that hour that I passed the message down the line. I had hardly spoken when light after light sprang up along the German front. Then quite near our dugouts, so near as to make me start and clutch my rifle, I heard a voice. With ears strained, I listened. And then all down our line of trenches, there came to our ears a greeting unique in war. English soldier, English soldier, a Merry Christmas, a Merry Christmas. Following that salute, boomed the invitation, come out, English soldier, come out here to us. For some little time, we were cautious and did not even answer. Officer, officers fearing treachery ordered us to be silent. But up and down our line, one heard the men answering that Christmas greeting from the enemy. How could we resist wishing each other a Merry Christmas, even though we might be at each other's throats immediately afterwards? So we kept up a running conversation with the Germans, 
all the while our hands ready on our rifles. Blood and peace, enmity and fraternity, war's most amazing paradox. The night wore on to dawn, a night made easier by songs from the German trenches and from our broad lines, laughter and Christmas carols. Not a shot was fired. Came the dawn, penciling the sky with gray and pink. Under the early light, we saw our foes moving recklessly about on top of their trenches. Here, indeed, was courage. No seeking the security of the shelter, but a brazen invitation to us to shoot and kill with deadly certainty. But did we shoot? Not likely. We stood up ourselves and called blessings on the Germans. Then came the invitation to fall out of the trenches and meet halfway. Still cautious, we hung back. Not so the others. They ran forward in little groups with hands held up above their heads, asking us to do the same. Not for long could such an appeal be resisted. Jumping up onto the parapet, a few of us advanced to meet the oncoming Germans. Out went the hands and tightened in the grip of friendship. Christmas had made the bitterest foes friends. Here was no desire to kill, but just the wish of a few simple soldiers, and no one is quite as simple as a soldier, that on Christmas Day, at any rate, the force of fire should cease. We gave each other cigarettes and exchanged all manner of things. We wrote our names and addresses on the field service postcards, and exchange them for German ones. We cut the buttons off our coats and took and exchanged the imperial arms of Germany. But the, gifts, the gift of gifts was Christmas pudding. The sight of it made the Germans' eyes grow wide with hungry wonder, and at the first bite of it, they were our friends forever. Given a sufficient quantity of Christmas puddings, every German in the trenches would have surrendered. All through the day, no shot was fired, and all we did was talk to each other and make confessions which perhaps were truer at that curious moment than in the normal times of war. As I finish this short and scrappy description of a strangely human event, we are pouring rapid fire into the German trenches, and they are returning the compliment just as fiercely. Screeching through the air above us are the shattering shells of rival batteries of artillery. So we are back once more to the ordeal of fire. the paradox of war and peace, the grappling to understand how one might be built in the midst of the other, the courage to extend one's hand to another or to begin again, the seeking for those moments of opportunity and the questioning, how shall we live? That story was about Christmas. We're coming up on Thanksgiving. And I don't know if you um, know the National Public Radio Story Corps, but they have deemed Black Friday to not be a day to go shopping, but rather to be a national day of listening. And so another invitation, perhaps you might consider taking up this national day of listening this year and seeking out a veteran to talk to. And if you do, you might ask them to share something about what the experience of serving in the military has taught them about what matters most in life or about how we can build a more peaceful world. Or if you are a veteran, you might offer the, offer the gift of sharing from your heart with someone who doesn't know your path directly. For this one day, 
we can practice releasing our assumptions and judgments and just listening deeply without needing to correct the other person's wrong perceptions. We can cultivate the courage that we all need to seek real understanding across the trenches of our differences. So I want to close tonight with a brief loving kindness practice, at the end of which I will ring the bell 11 times in honor of Armistice Day. And this is still done by some groups today, mainly peace groups. They usually do it at 11 a.m. We can't do that, unfortunately. But I'll ring the bell 11 times with respect for all of those veterans who have walked paths that I do not myself know directly. And also with encouragement for all who practice to understand how war arises, how it can be prevented, and how peace can be built and sustained. And so I'd invite you to join me in the metta practice. As always, translating the phrases, bringing your own meaning to the practice so that it might water the seeds within your heart. Allowing the body to be comfortable. Allowing the mind to be at ease. May I be safe from inner and outer harm. May I experience freedom and ease. May I have all that I need. May I be safe from inner and outer harm. May I experience freedom and ease. May I have all that I need. May you be safe from inner and outer harm. May you experience freedom and ease. May you have all that you need. May you be safe from inner and outer harm. May you experience freedom and ease. May you have all that you need. May all beings everywhere with special concern for those who are suffering because of war. May all beings be safe from inner and outer harm. May all beings experience freedom and ease. May all beings have all that they need. May all without exception be safe from inner and outer harm. May all experience freedom and ease. May all beings have what they need. As the Armistice Day Edict declared, may we perpetuate peace through goodwill and mutual understanding. May there be peace on the inside and the outside. May there be peace on earth. <laughs>